Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. So what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on the African Europe session. And what we want to do is actually look at how we feel about community and, you know, the natural and um, cultural heritage. What does natural and um, cultural heritage mean to communities? And then we will explore the whole area of um, community and civil society when we're sharing responsibilities or shared heritage and the future possibilities of filling the gaps among community, civil society and practitioners. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play all the videos that were submitted because the round table is going to address the pictures, the videos, all of what we're seeing. And we're all going to talk about our shared heritage, community, civil society, and our role we play within um, natural and cultural heritage. So if that's okay with Michael, we can start the videos. <laughs> To explore the concept of the Heritopolis, the relationship between heritage and the metropolis, we head to Mombasa, a city located on the coastal strip of East Africa. As the second largest city in Kenya after Nairobi, the capital, it is home to the biggest international seaport on the East African coast and two cultural heritage properties, Fort Jesus and Mombasa Old Town. The Portuguese constructed Fort Jesus to guard Mombasa's historic harbor and it is now a recognized UNESCO World Heritage Site. When viewed from above, its geometry resembles the layout of the human body. A significant portion of Mombasa's rich and diverse heritage is found in Old Town. 
It's among the heritage properties on the tentative list of UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. The emergence of new identities as a result of gentrification, urbanization, migration and globalization raises the question of what the future of heritage looks like in the metropolis and what this means for sustainable development. The ancient built environment of Mombasa Old Town utilized materials like coral stone and a mortar of lime. The roofs were built from locally available mangrove poles. The ornamental elements included arched lintels with exquisitely carved doorways and finely fashioned wooden balconies, exemplifying the peculiar fusion of cultural influences that is the hallmark of Swahili architecture. However, the modern built environment uses contemporary building materials like concrete and lacks elegantly designed hard wooden doors and balconies. This is ascribed to elements like the death of craftsmen skilled in using traditional materials and building contractors who are unaware of and disconnected from Swahili's rich cultural heritage. Nilikuwa date na msupa na mabiste zake. Gafla binvu, mamoru flani wakatuchafia meza na dishi ya bure. Nikauliza, mwona siyangu kiangi vitu za buerere. Msupa kanisho, okidai za buerere. Sheng, a new urban language, which is a hybrid of Kiswahili, English and other indigenous languages, has emerged as a new identity representing a third linguistic space between tradition and modernity, rural and urban, Kenya and the globalized world. It has undergone significant development, from a stigmatized slam code to a well-known language that represents linguistic innovation, identity rebellion, urban youth and the rejection of tribal identities. Shen has become a necessary marketing tool for both politicians and businesses in urban areas. The rise of new musical identities like Genge a subgenre that is derived from western hip-hop, reggaeton and dancehall has been influenced by Shen. The eminently danceable hits feature clever and often rude wordplay and catchy hooks with the accompanying music videos displaying vigorous and apologetic twerking. Genge is a far departure from the traditional genres like Tarab. Which are slow in rhythm with modest videos. Efforts to promote and conserve the rich and diverse cultural heritage have comprised of activities like the Modern Heritage of Africa workshops to create awareness and generate interest in heritage, poetic performances themed on heritage during the monthly Friday poetry, and contribution to technology projects like the Kiswahili dataset for Mozilla Common Voice. Whatever. And then the architects and interior designers who were on the team, their, t their staff, would sell tickets and invite the whole public. The public was pretty much people living in Atlanta at that time. You buy tickets and you come and you take a tour of the Street of Dreams. You go into each house one by one, they're all different. You have your score card and you score what you like about it. How did the architect choose? How did he do the functionality of the spaces? Da -da -da -da. Do I like where they put the bathrooms, the master bedroom, whatever? Okay. You score the interior designer. How well did she or did she do or did he do with the colors, fabrics, furniture, all that? You score the builder. How perfect was this construction? Can I tell, you know, some flaws or not? So, okay, right. At the end of the day, we tally up, and the best architect wins. The best interior designer. You, you don't even have to be on the same team to be like, I like this interior designer, but I like this architect. I like that builder. Food and drink is great. What was the goal? The goal wasn't just to have a great architectural event. The goal was to see how did the citizens, the end users, the homeowners, the buyers, how did they score the architecture? How did they score how the house was designed? 
how comfortable it was, how affordable it was, blah, blah, blah. Why? Because if you now replicate that design or those features, your houses are going to be selling. The horse, Equus Caballus, was imported to the island of Crete at the end of the 3rd millennium BC and quickly became part of everyday life. Horses are present in archaeological contexts, art, mythology and poetry. During the 18th and 19th centuries, a horse type specific to Creed is mentioned by foreign travelers. In 1895, the Ottoman administration declared the Cretan horse as a particular breed and its crossbreeding and export were forbidden. Today, the Cretan horse is understood as part of local tradition, a historical patrimony and an integral part of Crete's cultural heritage. The island's geographical, climatic, historical and cultural characteristics are imprinted in its body shape and character. In the context of a long-term economic crisis, a lack of horse breeding expert and state help, the Cretan horse faces extinction. Enormous investments in tourism and energy pushed not only horses from their traditional landscapes. Therefore, we established the Cretan Horse Rescue Research and Horsemanship Center, a non-profit institute based on citizen initiative, providing a home to horses in need and education programs for breeders and riders. The center is part of a larger citizen project focused on the protection of the historical landscapes of the island.
So th there's been a number of people who have been instrumental in the rescue of these buildings. A number of organisations, but particularly the people at those organisations, have kept uh, together as a team throughout the whole project. So if you look at Historic England, you know, Kate Wilson and the support that she's given to this project has been immense throughout the last six years. At the Architectural Heritage Fund, Gavin Richards, the support and the funding that they've been able to provide, uh, we wouldn't have been able to operate without. Uh, at the council, both Mark Taylor and Dan Hattle uh, have given us the support and encouragement that, we, that we've needed. The project was a real collaboration between uh, all sorts of agencies. We had, um, um, you know, us as architects, we were working with the Tyne and Weir Building Preservation Trust with, with, with Martin, um, and we, we, we looked at the design and how, how, how we could um, change the building uh, for, for new uses, working with Pop Rex as well. So effectively they became our clients so we were designing the interior for them. Um, obviously we had um, Sunderland City Council and their conservation team uh, and, and their has partners um, you know, providing assistance and a guidance and helping us get through the planning and listed building stages um, uh, uh, and helping us along that road. I think it's really important to do these type of projects because um, you know, without the, without the heritage uh, money and the, the has money, um, these buildings would have just gone to, to, to rack and ruin. They, you know, they were on the verge of being demolished. Previous owners had looked to demolish the sites. Um, you know, they were beyond uh, economic repair um, w w with normal sort of private funding. So this type of money is absolutely vital because you just, we just couldn't do it. We just couldn't do it without it. Uh, and then during the, co the community consultation, we were looking for names of people to work with. And the community came up with the name of Pot Rex. And that's when the partnership started w w with Pot Rex. Ross Millard from the, uh, the Future Heads, from the Mac Trust, from my band, Frankie and the Heartstrings. Um, I think Martin Holtz from the um, Tiny Way Building Preservation Trust had got in touch with him somehow or by a third party. I don't know, Ross has always, he's got his fingers in pies. I don't know how he gets them in there, but he's like, he has. And then he said, oh, you should talk to, talk to Dave from Pop Rex. I think Martin had done a bit of a consultation in the East End and asked what they would like this space to be. And I think the initial thoughts, his thoughts were affordable housing because people do need affordable housing around here and it's a reasonable thing. But this is the people from the East End didn't say that. They said they wanted something community based, something that can, you know, something to do was what came back. And our name came up a few times and that's how it works, which is the highest compliment we can have. I was more flattered about that than any organisation coming come to us. And the first thing I did was go back into the East End and say thank you and introduce myself, you know because they had some magic that we felt could change the project completely. Yes, they were you know, a small operation uh, running from a, a small community coffee shop, but the, the reach and their impact, you could just feel that they had the uh, ability to develop a vision for the, for the site and see it through. I want to leave something for me, my son to look back on and. So there is selfish reasons there, there as well, but no, one, no one's going to be leaving here like working with Pop Rex saying that we didn't try. The investment that has been made in terms of, but more in terms maybe of uh, people's time and interest and, and uh, developing that partnership it has been really crucial. And I think also the attention that that brings to this area has been really important just because it's not necessarily the area people usually pay that much attention to in this way, right? So I think it also really shows like, okay, we're willing to like make an effort and look to these buildings, these people, these futures, uh, instead of always the same sort of like grade one listed things that we, yeah, that are not here. Another really interesting thing about this project is that from a researcher perspective, normally you're kind of somewhat parasitic. You're asking people to join their project, to observe, to be there, if you're interested in ethnographic methods like doing social research. But the great thing about the, the lab and it being a partnership is that you're an actor on a sort of level with other actors. And that's what's really great about building these kinds of relationships and, and further 
um, collaborations is that everyone sort of respects each other's knowledge and expertise. So this is a really important example of how partnership can work for historic buildings. Uh, no player in this project could have worked alone. Um, the owner needed the City Council, the City Council needed Historic England, Historic England needed the owner, um, all of, uh, and, and other people in, in the team as well. They all needed to work together to bring about this project. So, um, most importantly, working in partnership allows people to make bold decisions. The entrepreneurialism of the owner was backed up by the safety net of Historic England working in partnership with Sunderland City Council to provide grant, to provide resources and expertise to help bring this project forward. And it couldn't have happened without all of us working in a focused way in collaboration. A real difference is, I think, that you can establish companies here, little, little firms who offer work in the inner city area. Because this was a model in Berlin for more than 100 years and now all the production facilities are moving out because the pressure on the real estate market is so high that nobody can afford to pay uh, for a workshop in the inner city area. So, but here you can, and uh, this makes a difference, I think. everybody. I hope you enjoyed our videos on heritage across Europe and Africa and so I will invite the speakers to talk about their videos and tell us how it, what it means to have civil society and um, communities work on this heritage site. So I would like to introduce, um, I, Vera is supposed to be co-chairing with me, right? Where's Vera? Yes, <laughs> but it's fine. Do you want to take it from me then? <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so maybe look, so I can start with the comments to uh, our videos, uh, which we collected, uh, so from Greece. I think it will be also pretty symbolical because uh, uh, so we presented two videos from Crete and everybody knows where Crete is placed. So Crete is always something as a bridge between Africa and Europe. So uh, we are still like physically, we are still chunk of European continent plague. But uh, many of our landscape there are landscapes that are really very African. And also so in the in the, um, in the history, uh, during a very long period, Crete and Northern Africa were creating uh, so one united uh, land called, for example, in the, uh, so during the Roman period, uh, a province of Crete and Kirenai. So um, also when you see the map, so create yeah. something as a button, which is closing together these two uh, these two continents. But although it is so nice land, uh, there are many problems with heritage uh, in Crete. Um, <clears throat> so I prepared a short comment to the videos which we collected from Crete and also from other parts of Greece, from Evia and from Mani. So. You, everybody probably will would agree that uh, we live in interesting times, where cycles of crisis, wars, poverty, refugees, and psychosomatic and psychosocial illnesses overwhelm our psychosomatic and social lives. The signing of the World Heritage Convention was the culmination of the effort of the international community and especially of the people of culture, who in one way or another wanted a new global framework of understanding of our common heritage, a barrier of civilized society to wars and the exploitation of our weakest fellow human beings, our ecosystems and, uh, and our planetary co-inhabitants. 50 years later, despite undeniable progress, challenges remain for the people and the sciences of heritage and culture. It is crucial to understand today's distinct and qualitatively new juncture. The natural sciences or the earth sciences, if you want, have most rigorously defined the character of our age. We are living, producing and reproducing in the age of the Anthropocene. All the violence and upheaval that our civilization has wrought on the earth system, ecosystems and biology of our world come back, comes back to us as a reflection in our lives, in our behaviors, in the way we treat our sh shared heritage and our planetary cohabitants that we do not have still disappear. People of culture and heritage and international conventions cannot overlook our age, objectively define it by the natural sciences, by reproducing practices and approaches outdated by more than a century. To one degree or another, today's wars that take on the character of a world war, the social impoverishment and overwhelms the different environments of our world and the mass extinctions of species egal to us, constitute among others expressions of how we approach our common heritage. So we, as uh, uh, Epitropi Politoni Erapetras, as uh, Erapetra Citizens Committee or Association, reject the dominant model of separating the cultural from the so called natural heritage. We see culture as part of our planetary system and the ecosystems in which we operate. In this way, we also reject the narrow anthropocentric logic, logic that reproduces the violence and exploitation of non human beings, that reproduce, among other things, nationalism and racism. In Era Petra Citizens Committee arose from, uh, from the need to defend the officially recognized by the Greek state United Archaeological Zone of the Era Petra Isthmus in its organic unity with the ecosystem of which it is part. Uh, the committee opposed the geological and visual violence caused by the zoning of the wind turbine industrial park by the Greek state. On the contrary, according to international conventions, 
the Greek state and the heritage protection services had to protect these values. So <clears throat> the committee, so the people of the committee met not by chance or on the basis of ideologies or religious beliefs. They were, and there are the people who for years now have been defending with their sweat, the right to exist of the centuries old trees, especially so the olive trees of the region, the unique Cretan horse in the natural historical landscape. And so I want to stop a little bit here. It's very much symbolic, you know, so each olive tree can survive for millennia, but not by itself. So it must be cared by people. So it means when you have some very old olive trees in the landscape, it means that there is a big tradition of caring of them. It's the same family, same people coming every year to that tree and they care about it. They are watering it, so they harvest it. The change, the history is changing. The history flows, but the same people and the same tree are still so united and cooperating uh, so on everyday base. And it's very much similar with horses. So horses are walking along people almost from the beginning of, uh, uh, of the existence of, uh, of people on, uh, on earth. So then in horses, so our history is also imprinted. So horses are so real serious archaeological and anthropological source. Well, so, but let's go back to, let's go back to Era Petra committees. Beyond our collective effort to exchange knowledge ex and experiences, beyond cinematic um, claims to prevent the overthrow of everything historical and natural around us by state and suprastate structures, we met other collectives from Greece and abroad. We coordinated our actions and practices. All together today, we consider our heritage a part of our being that is being turned upside down by the processes set in motion by the new natural historical epoch of the Anthropocene. We accept that modern conclusions about the dying culture do not limit the cultural creativity of human. For us, trees, animal, and especially social animals like the horse are carriers and creators of culture that, so, that co-shape the ecosystem in which we live and characterize us by making us different with all our good and bad. On this basis, we also defend the egal legacies of each place and each social group. The effort of our world heritage from the first moment found us in agreement. We drew ideas from the colorful river of ideas and practices on heritage issues. In essence, the creation of our world heritage is a modern necessity of our time. The need for egal defense and conservation constitutes the only option in our natural historical era. It is the only choice that really opposes wars, nationalism, racism, and violence toward everything natural and cultural around us. Yesterday, in Greece, a river of ordinary people, collectives, and defend our common heritage and conservation flooded the capital of Evia, uh, the town of Halkida, expressing their reaction to the destruction and our turning of their heritage by wind turbines. I was just finishing, so then I will let the last sentence uh, for somebody else. <laughs> Thank you, Vera. Okay, so we have a couple of speakers who are going to touch on natural and cultural heritage within their sites, but how communities and civil society interact within that. And so I know Vera, you're supposed to be speaking on that. Um, Arafat is speaking, Mandeli, um, Uluwatoi, Joe, Luz, and... Um, Barbara as well. So maybe we'll we'll just introduce everybody that is going to be on the panel and then we'll try and trash out this whole civil society and communities within cultural landscapes. How happy to be happy to be part of uh, this discussion. Um, our world heritage. My name is Arafat Mu. I do work for Swahili Port Hub uh, Foundation. We're based in Mombasa and it's an NGO that seeks to nurture the talents and skills of youths in areas of technology, creative and arts and uh, heritage. And um, yeah, our founding uh, happened uh, courtesy of uh, National Museums of Kenya. And I'm glad 
uh, that uh, we have Dr. Purity from National Museums of Kenya. So the video uh, that was played um, early on um, on uh, the heritage in uh, the metropolis of Mombasa. So I'll start by explaining that, is that uh, what we're trying to showcase in that video is to illustrate how uh, the cultural heritage of Mombasa and its metropolis is evolving with time as a result of aspects as such as um, mostly urbanization um, into, uh, into Mombasa. So Mombasa is uh, the second largest city after the capital Nairobi. So as a result of that, uh, there's sort of like lots of, um, there's been lots of um, intermingling between uh, different cultures, which has uh, brought up different aspects in terms of like um, aspects relating to music, aspects relating to culture, and also aspects relating to, and also aspects relating to art. Um, so for example, in terms of, um, in terms of um, language, uh, so Kiswahili, which is one of the most uh, spoken languages in the world, and also um, an official language in Kenya. So there's been an emergence of a new uh, form of language known as um, Sheng, which is um, a hybrid of Swahili and English. And actually Sheng um, originated um, uh, from the former settlements, mostly from, uh, from Nairobi. So because of um, um, urbanization, that is also coming to Mombasa. So you realize most of we urban youth, the sort of like Swahili that we speak is actually not the original Kiswahili, but rather more of, uh, more of the Sheng, which is very, very dynamic. Then the other aspect also comes to, uh, the other aspect comes to um, music. So uh, previously it used to be sort of like the music used to be slow, uh, the videos used to be so modest, but because of uh, influences, especially from the West, I uh, realize now the music videos that youth uh, find more appealing are kind of like uh, the music is very fast. So for example, like Gengeton, which is, um, um, has got influences uh, from hip hop, as well as reggae and gang, uh, as well as gangeton, right? Uh, sorry, as well as hip hop. It's mostly hip hop and uh, hip hop and reggae. So um, that has also influenced the kind of like music that uh, the urban youth are mostly uh, listen to. So how we as Swahili Port are working with the community. So because of our reach in terms of like um, networks with partners, uh, one of the ways are we working to uh, promote and conserve our heritage, especially among um, the community is um, kind of like um, mobilizing resources and holding workshops to sort of like create awareness among the, especially youths are on the importance of preserving our heritage, uh, but also um, enabling them to uh, find a sustainable livelihoods in relation to in relation to heritage. Then the other partnerships that we are working on are also um, in line uh, with finding ways of uh, preserving our heritage, especially using uh, digital technologies. Uh, so hopefully more will come up as the presentation goes on. Uh, back to you, Toki. Thank you very much. Uh, Mandeli will be next, and I'll just put a, I'll just put the list of speakers, you know, in the chat box so that you know when to jump in once the speaker oh. ends. All right, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks, Togi, for the uh, invitation. Um, my name is Madeli Okumabwa, I'm the founder of CPDI Africa, which stands for the Community Planning and Design Initiative Africa. And what we do is uh, try to preserve architectural heritage in the built environment through um, contemporary buildings. And that is translating traditional design elements into modern versions for building contemporary buildings so that these, this, this heritage, this culture lives on today and into the future. Um, the video that was uh, shown earlier was taken from our uh, CPDI Expo and Workshop 2022, which was held this summer in Abuja. We had students and um, architects, licensed architects, planners, um, 
folks from all the allied professions attend our workshop and exhibition. So um, our exhibition. <clears throat> sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 Sorry about that. Um, there we go. Um, so the workshop held this summer, and uh, the the exhibition that was shown was the result of some of our winning designs that come in through our um, biannual African architecture exhibition. So we have designers around the world to send in prototypes of contemporary design, contemporary African design, once again, inspired by traditional heritage and culture. Again, trying to preserve this going forward in our architectural practices. So we had an exhibition that showcased um, some of those winning designs. We had a lecture, we had a workshop um, going over the principles that guided the designers around the world in their submissions. Those principles were guided by the CPD Africa five elements of Afrocentric architecture, talking about culture and spirituality, aesthetics, building materials, community engagement, and how when you translate or you ref reference these um, ideologies into architecture, you will preserve African architecture. So we had lectures and workshops on that. And then we had um, an excursion where we got on a few tour buses and took the delegates around uh, the city of Abuja. Most of you, I hope, know that Abuja is a relatively new city, master planned, our new capital here in Nigeria, um, designed and built, designed by uh, an American and, and a Penzo Tange Japanese architect, quite Eurocentric design. But we were lucky enough to have a few architects, some um, um, uh, students of ours at CPDI, who had the opportunity to create some architecture that preserved their culture, their culture and their identity. So we took off on an excursion um, and toured five places in town, showing examples of contemporary Afrocentric architecture. The uh, video shows me kind of giving a brief. Um, overview of um, an event that actually took place in the US, but one that I'm trying to modify uh, for Nigeria. And that is how can you build prototypes that feature architectural elements that the community still appreciates pre-colonial, right? Actual African design philosophies. Um, how can we uh, come up with prototypes that feature these elements and then get the end users, the community, to kind of sign off on them, showing their appreciation and their value, so we can in include those elements in the architecture going forward, teaching in curriculums, um, and definitely preserving in the architecture that's designed by architects today. So that's what we do at CPDI, and that's what our brief video was about, um, to share that with you. Thank you so much for that, Mandeli. Um, Ibrahim, do you want to jump in now? Because I know you have to leave for um, 27. Yes, thank you so much. My name is Jan Ibrahim. I'm from Benin and uh, I'm working, uh, I am director and co-founder of uh, Ecomuse Tatasumba. It's uh, the first ecological museum in West Africa. And as you, you see on the video, uh, we we try to help local community about how we can preserve. As uh, my uh, the uh, the last presentation was saying, how we can preserve um, traditional architecture because because of climate change is very affected and there is no any more materials to 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 build it to build a new house and uh, also youth people don't they are not interested about the whole building they want to be uh, on the new building, uh, big building, like in Europe, like in United States, and try to um, like uh, to leave this heritage that need to be preserved. So we create um, a school of uh, transmission, and then we put together whole, whole generation and new generation. You can see on my video that there is many uh, people, like children, youth, women, men working together. That is the way we use to make transmission of knowledge. 
because there is no university, there is no school where you can learn about how to build these houses and it's going to disappear. So we take um, uh, all of our um, possibility to create this school and bring uh, in these schools dance, music, everything can be interest uh, youth to come with them, yeah, us and do this, uh, um, this, uh, this work of uh, preservation. And I will finish to say that we are here, for example, at COP27 to bring the voice of cultural heritage and say that we can learn from our heritage and uh, have some solution about, about climate change, you know, because uh, the, the modern construction is very uh, important uh, about global warming. If we can use local materials, we can be more ecological, we can have some solution about, about our, our planet. So that is what we are doing and we are very happy to be here and share all this with you. And we, we, we are very happy to see many of these projects around the world. And we, we, we hope we can work with uh, everyone who wants to work with us. Uh, thank you so much and see you uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you so much about, you know, really enjoyed it. And it's, uh, it's crucial that he has mentioned that there's no university and we will be losing all these elements if we don't do something about that. So let me introduce Oluwatoi now and she will have her own five minutes of fame. <laughs> So good afternoon, everybody from the, my own part of the world. I'm in Nigeria, Lagos. My name is Oluwato Inshogweso, and I'm the founder of Asha Heritage Africa Foundation. And we document, we preserve um, architectural heritage as well as cultural intangible heritage through proof. And one of the things we do is to look at the listed building that Nigeria has, which has only 65 listed buildings. And we then identify other buildings that have the heritage status, but are not on the list. And then we go into such buildings or structures to document them. One of the reasons why we're documenting just going on, like Ibrahim said, is everyone wants the new, the new buildings with new materials, with new identity. However, they're forgetting that some of these identities and some of the buildings bear their own history that actually speak about their identity. So we try to look at the elements, the Afrocentric elements in these buildings. We try to identify them. We identify the skills that have been used in the construction of these buildings. And then we bring about the community to try to build or replicate these skills and pass on the skills to younger generation. We also go about documenting these buildings in such a way that the government can then add them to their listed list. But um, unfortunately, it's taking real time for the list to be updated and include most of these buildings. And um, what we're trying to do now is try to publish them on our own website, because if we don't do that, these buildings, um, they, they become dilapidated. And over time, the land is sold to new companies who now have new structures on them. So um, that is what we do. We try to also educate the community so that they can call upon us when they find this kind of structures in danger, and then we can document and have them in record. That is what we do. Thank you. Sounds amazing. I think I'm supposed to continue. And I, you all do such great work, and now I have to talk about my project. <laughs> no, it's a really nice project, but it is a very different scale and a very different thing, I suppose. So the, the project, I'm, I'm, I'm Luz Feldpaus. I'm a researcher and a lecturer at Newcastle University, so I come from academic position. But the project I'm talking about is, uh, or the video is about, is a project I've been involved in as a researcher, but is actually, a, we were using it kind of as a living lab. So it was an actual restoration project that we were just part of as, as the university. And in itself, it was a bigger case study in open heritage. I will put a link in the chat in a bit. Um, which is a big European funded project, EU funded project about adaptive heritage reuse in uh, European countries. Um, so it was really uh, focusing on um, the governance and financing of these kind of projects rather than what we see very often is that the research in this field is focused on the interventions and the architecture and the 
and the way um, adaptive reuse is, is done. Um, so we really focus on sort of like how how is it financed? Where does the money come from? Who is involved in these projects? So that's the whole the big project. And then in Sunderland, we were testing some of these things. So the case study in Sunderland is a restoration project uh, or adaptive reuse project of three um, quite big buildings uh, that were totally falling apart and that uh, the Building Preservation Trust, the Time Aware Building Preservation Trust, together with Poprex, which is a local uh, organization that used to be a kind of uh, used to be a band, a, U a UK based band. Uh, they became uh, a coffee shop and a music venue because they, they changed the way they operated. Um, and together they kind of did that restoration project. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, as a university, we were kind of part of that. Um, and it was really important, I think, to to be part of it, to see from behind the scenes how these projects go rather than do an evaluation afterwards and kind of get you know, the nice stories, but not the real inside stories. Um, and a lot of this was to do with like, how do you involve community? How do people relate to these kind of projects? Um, we can say that actually, you know, we are doing it for people, but is that really true? And who are the people we are doing these kind of projects for? And we definitely see in that project also that, of course, some people engage with that, but a lot of people in the neighborhood um, still really struggle to engage with this project because it's a, it's a very particular project. Um, and I mean, maybe they don't need to, or maybe we can think about uh, other ways of, of working with them. But it, it is a really interesting project to have a look at. We have more videos also if you're really interested. Um, because then we are also exploring a bit more the events that we've organized to to kind of engage with communities in the in the in the area. In the end, the the project itself is a heritage project and a restoration project, as as you know, like um, as I'm talking about it, but also very much a local cultural um, venue. So actually, what becomes more and more important is the stuff that is now happening in the buildings, uh, which is music gigs, uh, s social stuff for kids. It's also a coffee shop. So slowly, I think it is becoming much more of a of a local hub rather than a restoration project, which I'm very happy about. So I will stop there and um, we can talk more later. <laughs> uh, Christine, you want to, Katerina? I think it's Katerina that wants yeah. to jump in. Yes. All right. Hello, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, our video was the first one you saw today. Um, the first video you saw, I say hello from Karisto, South Evia in Greece. Um, I will tell you a few facts on the situation in Evia, but I'm also sort of representing the area of money in Peloponnesos in Greece, um, where the situation is similar to our own one. Um, Evia is the second biggest island in Greece after Crete, and it has become in the very recent years a permanent well, let's say battlefield of interests of wind energy companies. And this has um, tragic environmental and socioeconomic consequences. Um, most of the area affected uh, by the construction of wind industrial facilities, and um, it belongs to the European Natura 2000 network. And it has also been included to the special protection zones for wild birds and the special conservation zones for habitats. So in our area, in South Asia, we have got already 450 installed or almost installed wind uh, turbines and another 450 will follow, which is uh, an enormous amount. Um, so in the name of the, let's call it the green transition, the losses are irreparable. So they, they are very bad and, and not to be repairable. Um, we lose um, unique uh, natural landscapes of Olhi. Um, excavation and roads and transport networks have forever altered the ridges of the mountain. Um, vegetation has been lost. We have serious effects on the bird life and uh, on beekeeping, on agrotourism, to name some of the sectors that are directly affected. Um, and we have also uh, the destruction of ancient sites and findings and of traditional stone buildings and dry stone walls, as you saw in the video that we sent. 
Um, I represent the Association for the Protection of the Environment of South Caristia, so-called SPANC, and we fight with all our strength the last years um, to save uh, all these that I named you, the beautiful landscapes, the ancient places, traditions. Uh, we do this with uh, informative events and protests um, and with uh, dozens of complaints about uh, environmental violations of the wind energy companies. Um, and uh, our association also attaches um, importance to the degradation and destruction of archaeological sites from the construction of wind turbines. Um, and uh, this fight uh, continues, and the same situation we face also in Mani in Peloponnesus. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Katerina. Um, it's quite interesting what is happening in all the different areas and how all the interactions mm -hmm. happen within the sites. And it's it's very nice to hear what everyone's doing to sort of you know bring that to the fore. So we will end um, this particular discussion now with Anne Jonas, and we will show the video from Antigua. I think um, she's going to introduce herself now and tell us more about the video because it wasn't part of the other videos, but we'll have that right after her speech. And then Vera will talk about everything that has been said. Thank you. Much Toki, and it's certainly a pleasure to join this very distinguished group here. And I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Barbara Pico, who will wave, <laughs> she'll wave to the group. Um, and she has been the mover and shaker in this particular initiative as our cultural envoy here in Antigua and Barbuda, working on preserving intangible cultural heritage and working with women in particular who have been blazing the trail in trying to preserve a specific type of traditional artisanship, which we refer to as heritage artwear, that of seed work, which has its origins in the um, African, you know, African heritage. Although it was a challenge for us as Caribbean people, we certainly have these gems the skill sets which would have been passed down by our four parents. And now there are five women, five elderly women who have the skills as master artisans in this particular area of skill. And they are teaching younger women. And so our group, which is Intangible Cultural Heritage, Antigua and Barbuda, and through its uh, commercial component, <coughs> Botanique Studios, we're working along with Barbara and another team of young ladies in the US. Um, that's uh, we, Joseph, as well as Ali Merv, both Antigua and of Antigua and Heritage, um, working to ensure that this particular intangible cultural heritage is preserved. And I believe it would be fantastic if it is possible for you to show the video because I do not believe that the others who are viewing will understand the architectural significance of this particular craft. It is not a building to live in, to work in, to move in, to have activities in, as we have been hearing, but actually it's architecture that we can wear and we can yeah. use as personal um, pieces, as um, decor for homes, as collectibles. So if it's possible for you to show that video, seen just a snapshot of the work, this particular artisanship, 
where the women take seeds, which by the way, are from plants that are invasive. And so they grow very quickly. I'm sure you would be familiar with the wild tamarind if you are into plants and they produce thousands of seeds. And these seeds can be utilized to create this intricate jewelry, whether it's home decor, whether it's personal accessories, belts, coin purses, earrings. And so the preservation of this particular craft is now being supported through the Tides Foundation and Dr. Barbara Paker in providing for workshops for young women and for others who are interested in learning the particular skills so that they can not only preserve this traditional heritage, but also create a livelihood for themselves and their families. Um, the lady you would have seen in the, the video, she has been at it for over 50 years. And she used that as her only source of income to take care of herself and her family and her children, taking them through school. And she's still um, teaching this particular um, craft to others and anyone, particularly young people who are interested. So we are working with her as well as four other women to teach other women in terms of being entrepreneurs. So Intangible Cultural Heritage of Antigua and Barbuda Inc will also be providing support in terms of table level. And we have already um, set up the website, which you would have seen in the chat room. And you can take your time to check this out and look at some of the pieces which are available on the global level. So not only will the tourists here in Antigua and Barbuda benefit, but the entire globe, including Antiguans and Barbudans and others who are interested in heritage artwork in the diaspora. In COVID, it was particularly interesting for us because um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but as a Caribbean island nation, we are heavily dependent. It's our main income earner, tourism. And so once we had the lockdown, it meant that a lot of people lost their jobs, their businesses closed down. And through this particular initiative, we were able to provide support for a number of women and their families throughout the COVID period when we had little or no, uh, what should we say, visitors from overseas. And so they are now seeing the benefit of taking it globally. And so as a result, we are working with them to make this a reality. Thank you, Annie, and thank you, Katerina and uh, Lowe's, uh, Olubatin, Madili, Ibrahim, and uh, I hope I didn't forget, and Arafat, I hope I didn't forget anybody so who was sharing uh, 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 experiences uh, so from, uh, from the field. Uh, so I think that, uh, so we will agree, all of us, that it was very interesting. Um, so very interesting uh, afternoon of uh, of videos and their comments. So what I am taking from it is that uh, so there are really many people living in their special regions, sharing very special heritage, and unfortunately fighting for protecting something so valuable as uh, in reality their lives are. And I think so it's very important that uh, so we found a platform uh, on our world heritage to share our experience and our skills and uh, also our worries uh, about what's going on in the world today. So I think that we still have time for questions. Is it so, Mikey? Correct. We have the time to still show two more videos and uh, two more speakers. And then indeed it's time. I think we should go ahead with that. Okay, great. Yeah. These are two videos from Instagram. Mm. From Bot Botanic Studio. <laughs> <laughs> Tati. My name is Louise Edwards. I'm doing this craft work for over 50 years. Wild tamarind seed and jumpy bead seed handicrafts are unique and rare to the twin island state of Antigua and Barbuda. 
It is a craft that binds our people to our traditional African roots through a dark history of enslavement. They are skillful in many handicrafts, such as the exquisite beadwork, which is reminiscent of the African origin of these peoples. You have these seeds all over the Caribbean island, but some people don't know what to do with it. Wild tamarind trees are an invasive plant species found throughout the Caribbean and many other parts of the world. We call them wild tamarind, but Europeans call them mimosa. And the process prior to creating these seed wares are painstaking to say the least. The pods are growing on the branch and we need to, we throw them onto the sheet and then eventually we'll pick them up, put them into a pillowcase, rub them out like a bag. So we make it easier instead of just opening each individual part. We got to boil them, give them some air for a day and then we Welcome to the Water's Edge Museum, where we are actively fostering intangible cultural heritage. The Water's Edge Museum embraces, explores, and tells again and again in different ways the complex stories of the founding Black families, the people who harnessed their power and placed it quietly but resolutely into the hands of their descendants. The museum honors how they lived and how their lives mattered. Some would say we even push our local community to understand what it means to not see oneself in the history they learn. Mortar's Edge, it help you find yourself. You know, you have to understand where you came in order to get a better understanding where you're going. And Mortar's Edge is perfect for that. And it's true. Our goal is to aid in heritage protection by empowering the youth of today to find their place in history and identify their own positive and unique voices when facing contemporary issues and challenges. But we also strive to teach the community methods of altering the path to environmental destruction by presenting how climate change impacts undeserved rural communities on the Chesapeake Bay. We hold sessions with local summer camps, schools, and marginalized youth to teach them the benefits of recycling, composting, and gardening in hopes to promote and preserve the cultural and historical landscape of farming and African-American autarky within our region. Which is loved by the youth and people of all ages, but what really keeps them coming back is the music. How sweet the sound. In an attempt to bring an already dynamic history to life through artistic representation and oral histories is how the Maryland Spirituals Initiative was born. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh and the Maryland Spirituals Initiative seeks to begin a global conversation about the essential role of spirituals as America's finest art form. An intergenerational group of Maryland singers and musicians coming together to share in the Eastern Shore tradition of singing African American spirituals and classic gospel while teaching the importance to all who will listen and who want to learn. Reminder, just as important as it is to hear these spirituals, it is just as important to learn from what they meant and their importance, not only to the black community, but as the soundtrack to the struggle of an American fight for freedom and liberty. I'm um, Barbara Baker, and so I'm speaking on behalf of, of Ree Joseph, who was was on the call, but I think she lost the internet connection. We're working as with Ann Joseph from kind of fragile rural heritage areas where Wi-Fi is unstable at best. So the Water's Edge Museum is the first museum in the United States to uh, acknowledge and honor the founding black families of America. And it does so through the telling of the history, uh, through art, music, literature, and through the, the telling of the history by descendants of those founding families. So uh, the Water's Edge Museum is only steps away from the only UNESCO um, documented Middle Passage port on the entire right-hand side of the Chesapeake Bay. 
which is the largest bay in North America. So it's, it's quite a remarkable place. And the Water's Edge Museum's uh, director, Reed Joseph, um, is, is the first, she represents the sort of the first women of color to manage art museums on the entire right-hand side of the Chesapeake Bay, which is true and, and remarkable in many ways. Um, the Water's Edge Museum is now partnering with another museum across the river from them called the Bellevue Passage, which honors the founding black businesses of America. So there's a survival of this incredible rural heritage of people who uh, whose ancestors arrived in chains, but worked to build the early democracy of America through um, not just through stamina and through strength, but through genius and an ability to uh, work with agriculture and fishing to become really the sustainers of this country. So that's what Ree would have had to say. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for um, all the comments. Uh, Micah, do you want to say something? Because we have a whole lot of sessions going on throughout the um, week as well. So um, Micah, we'll talk on that. Yeah. Okay, I can uh, do the, the closing then. I, um, I'm really impressed by the number of um, video participations. And I think this is also really a new tool to collab to communicate about heritage in our field. Um, it shows to be a challenge also, the technical challenge of today. <laughs> we are together today because of the 50th anniversary um, uh, of, uh, of the convention. And yeah, times are really changing fast and it, we're all searching, let's say, on how <laughs> this next 50 years will be. And I think these videos really help to, yeah, to support um, the creation of a vision. We would love to further embark on these sort of explorations and missions uh, with, with, yeah, on this open stage. And after this session, there will be another session starting in an hour about um, Latin America, Caribbean and North America. Um, this uh, session will start in an hour. Tomorrow we have a more institutional um, angle on the same topic. Uh, we invited many international institutions that will hopefully um, yeah, also give their vision and share what, they're, what they find challenging in collaborating and um, participation process. Um, then the day after we will have um, here in Florence, uh, a local celebration of 40 years World Heritage uh, uh, listing of Florence. Christina Cameron will have the keynote speak. Uh, Christina Cameron will be the keynote speaker. It will be broadcasted. So you can follow that if you want. And the day after, on Thursday, there is a series of um, uh, lectures, 10 minute lectures, I think, about the future of world heritage so this will really have to focus on the world heritage convention and how that will go in the future so we hope to um yeah to <laughs> to see you again uh if not this week uh maybe later um yeah we love to collaborate and thank you so 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 much thank you everyone <laughs>